You're listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 57. In this episode of the podcast, I'll be interviewing Hank Early. Hank's debut novel, Heaven's Crooked Finger, is uh, out today, November 7th. It's the debut novel in his Earl Marcus uh, mystery series, and it's uh, been described as an eerie, intense, and masterfully crafted book that transports readers to a secret community in the Georgia mountains. I've been looking forward to reading uh, Heaven's Crooked Finger since I've uh, long been interest- interested in the snake handling church communities in the Appalachian Mountains. I saw a documentary about that a while back and uh, that's uh, something that's featured in this novel and something that, w- that I asked uh, Hank about uh, during the interview. Uh, Hank spent um, much of his youth in the mountains of North Georgia but he's never held a snake. Uh, he now lives in central Alabama with his wife and two kids where he writes his uh, crime novels. Uh, So I'm excited to uh, bring you this interview uh, with Hank Early. Uh, Before I do that, one quick announcement. Um, I wanted to let you know uh, about a friend of mine, John Heinmarsh, who writes uh, techno-thrillers, and he recently published a a novel that's called The Darwin Project, which asks the question, will artificial intelligence be the end of humanity? It's a pretty topical uh, subject matter, with uh, Saudi Arabia recently granting citizenship to uh, artificial intelligence robots, so uh, it's a good time to uh, read about the th- about things that might happen in the, in the future. Who knows? Uh, but it's a it's a great thriller. Uh, go check it out at thrillingreads.com forward slash Darwin. All right, uh, coming up next is my interview with Hank Early. Hank, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Tell us just a little bit about yourself. Sure, Hank Early. I'm an Alabama writer. I write crime and uh, mystery, and my first uh, novel is coming out in a couple weeks, actually, on November 7th. It's called Heaven's Crooked Finger, and it's coming out from uh, Crooked Lane uh, Books on November 7th. And it's the first in a series. I've got a uh, second book that's uh, slated for a July 2018 release. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, first book? It's got Heaven's Crooked Figure, as you said. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about that uh, book, how that came together and what it's about? It is a book that's set in the uh, North Georgia mountains. Uh, my, uh, my family is originally from North Georgia, and it's sort of a fictionalized version of the place I used to, to visit as a child um, and through my teenage years. Um, and the main character is... Uh, a guy named Earl Marcus, who has been raised in a very fundamentalist, extreme kind of church. Uh, his father is sort of a legend in the mountains as far as a uh, preacher. He's a snake handling preacher. And um, early on in Earl's life, uh, he was he had some problems with his dad and his uh, father's religion and ended up sort of getting kicked out of the church and kicked out of the house. And then he went away for 30 years um, and it wasn't ever planning on coming back until he receives um, word that the one person he does care about in the mountains is about to die. So he wants to go back to see her. And when he goes back, he covers that there's some inconclusive evidence about his father's death. Um, he had thought his father had died, but according to some of the people there in the small mountain community, they say he is still alive and well in the mountains. And so despite himself, Earl decides to stick around and, and find out what, what exactly is going on. And that's sort of the, the premise of the book. It involves a lot of a lot of snakes, so people that are have a snake phobia might not want to <laughs> read it, but I've heard from several readers about the snake. So uh, that's, that's in a nutshell. I mean, I could go more, but I don't want to give anything away. So. But, you know, that's uh, so fascinating, too. I, I remember watching a documentary about the snake handling five, ten years ago, and I saw it, and Right. So fascinating. So fascinating. What the? What, what made you interested in that whole uh, aspect? It's, it's such a great idea, by the way, to, to write a mystery set in that in that world. <laughs> yeah, um, it, I'm sort of like you. I was always fascinated with. I didn't. I I don't have direct experience with the snake handling aspect, but I do ha- have some experience with. Um, I guess what you call some fundamental kind of uh, church experience. Um, but I, I, you know. I wanted to make it a little more interesting, so I, I thought, you know, what what could be the most fundamental, the most outrageous thing I could bring into this, and, and it was snake handling to me. 
Um, and and it, I think it, 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 it's very fascinating. I think you know why what people feel like they're gaining from that. Um, you know, it's almost it seems like an odd way to try to, um, I guess, worship God or whatever to me. So I, I I did try to kind of get underneath that and try to figure out why what would motivate a person to do that. Um, and I think it sort of fits in with Earl's father. He you know he kind of ruled or ruled might not be the right word, but um, he was successful. His church was successful because of his ability to manipulate people through fear. And I think the snake handling in the book kind of plays into how he does that. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I, I've always been fascinated by, by the snake handling aspects. And, uh, there, it happens here. I'm, I'm in Alabama and, um, there's a book, um, set in Alabama, um, by Dennis Covington, uh, about snake handling that is sort of a classic. And it, it's a, Nonfiction book, so uh, it really does go on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. And then, what's the Earl Mark? This, uh, what's his background? Is he like a, a, a police officer, or no? Uh, well, he is not actually. He's never been a police officer, but he started off when he he moved away from home. He kind of bounced around the country for a long time and ended up uh, settling in North Carolina and working as a as a bouncer, essentially, in some bars and that sort of thing. And he found out he had a talent for, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, dealing with the bad guys. They just didn't seem to scare him like they scared some people. Um, He was more scared of other things, as you'll find out when you read the book. Um, And then eventually he sort of fell into um, helping some people out and then then paying him for it. And it just sort of something he ended up being good at. So he got his PI license in uh, North Carolina. And then, um, and that kind of brings you back to the, up to the point where he travels to Georgia to investigate his father's death. So were you a fan of the, of the mystery thriller genre as a reader before you started to, to write them? Oh yeah. Uh, I'm absolutely. Um, I'm also a big, uh, horror guy. Uh, mm-hmm. so to me, this, this series and this book is sort of a, a good blend of the two. Um, because it's definitely got some horror elements in it, um, from the snakes to some, uh, there's some things in the book that sort of straddle the line between the supernatural and reality. And it's kind of one of those situations where, uh, the reader could maybe take it either way. Um, and I've always been fascinated by that as a reader and as a writer, uh, the, the kinds of books that, you know, are hard to classify, um, uh, that maybe kind of lead over into different genres, and I, I was really pleased with, with the horror elements in this. In fact, some of the early readers, that was one of the first things I heard was like, wow, I did not realize how scary this was going to be and how much like a, a horror novel is going to be. But at the same time, it is, it's, a, it's a crime novel, and um, yeah, I, I like to read both. James Lee Burke, I don't know if you remember him, he's probably oh, yeah. got to be one of my favorites. He was one of the first guys that I read that made me kind of start getting excited about crime and mystery. As a kid, I read, believe it or not, Agatha Christie. I read tons of her her novels and then sort of got into horror, became a big Stephen King guy, and then kind of came back to mystery and crime when I discovered James Lee Burke. I was reading out some of the, the, the reviews that have been coming out, and I, I really like it. And Erica Pruitt said it's a Southern Gothic detective story that will long leave readers catching their breath. Southern Gothic, I like that. That's Maybe not one you hear as much about, uh, depending oh. on where you are in the country, but uh, it's it definitely got its own subgenre. Uh, somehow my work tends to always kind of get classified as, as that. Even some of my short stories and, and things have been classified as Southern Gothic. It's not something I like necessarily intended to do, but but I'm happy with it. I, I love it when people say my stuff Southern Gothic. It makes me think of some of the other writers I love. A lot of, I don't know, uh, William Gay, the guy that he classifies as Southern Gothic, Tom Franklin, a Mississippi writer, and a lot of these guys, too, um, those two guys, their their work kind of straddles crime and and um, literary and even some horror in there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with that term. Yeah, I love it. I'm going to look into that a little bit more. That sounds like an awesome uh, uh, subgenre. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Think so. Uh, so, uh, so what inspired you to write your first book? Have you always been writing? Ever- I was a kid, one of, you know, one of the kids, probably like a lot of writers who 
wanted to the age. I enjoy telling stories to my little sister. I had kind of a, always a captive audience with her. She was about six years younger than me, and I delighted in telling her scary stories, and, and um, she'd always ask for more, so that made me feel good. You know, if somebody likes my, my stories I'm making up, and I always kind of harbored thoughts of being a writer one day, but honestly, I was too immature to sit down and really ever put pen to paper all the way till I was in my 20s, really my 30s, is when I decided to, to give it a shot and actually sit down and, and, and work on a, a novel. And um, my early efforts failed, and I ended up learning how to write by going, to, by going back to work on some short stories and, and writing some short stories, and that, that helped me learn how to tell a story. And so then I went back again in my 40s, and tried the novels again so but yeah it's definitely something i've always wanted to do i've always been a big reader and I always sort of imagined myself as a writer um it just took it was just a matter of discipline really and i, I didn't and, and maturity and uh i think that's a huge part of it if you lack the discipline and maturity you're probably not gonna be successful no matter how talented you are that's a typical yeah what's a typical day for you like when you're when you're actually writing a project well, that's a tough one because uh, my my schedule sort of, sort of varies. I'm a I'm a teacher, so I have I have summers off, and so in the summer I can really bear down and get a lot done. Um, and in the summer, my typical schedule will be writing a large chunk of the day, uh, and then sort of uh, relaxing in the in the afternoons. I rarely write at night, no matter what the case is. I just found my my body once I hit past supper time, once I've eaten dinner, then I'm probably not going to write again. And I know a lot of writers will stay up all night and do it. That's just not my thing. I'm a I'm an early morning writer. Uh, now, during the school year, I get a lot of my stuff done on weekends. Um, Saturdays and Sundays, I'm pretty much writing, you know, from the early morning until the afternoon. And I just sort of piece it together like that. I mean, I, I sometimes I have to do it in, after after work, you know, so I'll get in a couple hours here and there. Um, so... It's uh, it's been. I think I, I think I learned to do it um, during the busiest time of my life. So I, you know, I was, you know, newly married. Uh, we had two kids. I was teaching, coaching, and driving a school bus. And I found a way to still make time and and write. And once I learned I could do that, now now it seems, I won't say easy, but now it's easier because now I'm just my kids are older. They require less attention. Um, I don't drive a school bus anymore. I don't coach anymore. I just teach and, and write. So it it works out. And the, what the how, how's your writing process like? Do you um do you have like a my, do you do a lot of outlining or do you uh, just kind of sit down and start writing? My writing my writing process is honestly sort of a mess. Um, <laughs> it's the one area of everything I wish I could fix, and I just can't seem to quite fix it. Um, I'm a multiple draft guy, and that ends up making everything take a little longer. Uh, usually, I start with um, I start with a voice, sort of. I start with the voice, and uh, I start with setting, typically. And I sort of usually have a visual setting that, that fascinates me, and then I start with a voice that fascinates me, and I have no plot at all. But I'll go ahead and start writing. Uh, because I've tried outlining before. Everybody told me after my first attempts and failures at books, at writing novels, people told me, well, you need to do an outline. And I tried it. I gave it serious attempts. But what I found is that when I outlined, I lost interest in in the book itself. So I think I'm a writer that likes to kind of be surprised by, by the story as I'm making it up. So that keeps me interested. I, I sort of thrive off not knowing what's going to happen next myself. And um, what, what that means is once I finish a draft, then I have to kind of go back and, and rewrite large chunks of it just to make it all mesh together and to make it make more sense and to fix a lot of inconsistencies and that sort of thing. So it's not a process I would recommend to anybody, but, you know, I think you got to find what works for you. And so far, that's the, that's the way that's worked for me. That's the only way I've had any success. He's kind of doing it messy, multiple drafts, um, not being afraid to make mistakes or to take chances and that sort of thing. 
And what do you use to write? Do you use like a, a Word, uh, Word or some other writing software? I use, um, mostly I use Jupyter. Oh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that program. Uh, mm, yeah, that's a, the... Okay. Yeah, Scrivener uh, is what I usually do all my early drafts in, and eventually I have to shift over to Word, and that's usually when either I send it to my agent or, well, yeah, usually once I send it to my agent, I put it on a Word document, and then he's going to read it and make notes on it. So then I'm usually just revising in Word, and then, of course, when it goes to the editor, Word is, is what my editor uses too. So um, so I, I do I do it both, really, Word and Scrivener. A lot of the early drafting Scrivener and all the editing and revision happens in Word. And so what are some of the challenges when you're bringing a story to life? Oh, let's see. I should be able to answer this very easily because I just finished my second book, uh, turned it into my editor uh, Friday. So I've, I've sort of taken a break for like four or five days. Or maybe not even that long now. What's today, Tuesday? Yeah, about four days. And um, I had all kinds of challenges with that book. Uh, so many challenges. I think I think the the big challenge that I struggle with almost every book is motivation. I guess for the bad guys. I, I don't know if that's the right word for them, bad guys, but for the antagonists, I guess. Sometimes I, I, the motivation is the last thing that I get right, and it seems like it's the thing that kind of dogs every draft. Okay, I fix this, I fix this, but I still don't have, you know, any really good motivation, or their motivation is not clear, or you know, a lot of it revolves around the antagonist to me. I think I usually start off pretty with with pretty well realized characters um, that are, you know, the protagonist and his buddies or her buddies and friends and, and companions, those seem to be easier to me than the antagonists, which always kind of become alive in the later drafts. I hope they do anyway. Uh, so that'd be one thing. Um, another thing that, that's a challenge is there's always a, a sort of a tension for me between plot and voice and I guess maybe style and and the actual writing because I, I'm a you know, I, I want my writing to read to read well. I don't want it just it just to be straight plot. I'm a I'm a big guy. I really admire writing when I read. I want to read good good language and good writing. But sometimes it seems like when you lean hard towards plot, the writing tends to suffer. And when you when you lean hard towards writing, the plot tends to suffer. So there's a real balance there that I try to strike. And now you mentioned uh, with uh, this book, your um, your ex- you have experience with the uh, with the in that area, the the, the, the Georgia area. Uh, does your personality make it into any of your characters at all? Oh wow! Um, <laughs> not sure about that. Yeah, Earl, the main character, I suppose, has some aspects of my personality. He better be a little grumpy. And um, I think I've got that some, and he's sort of, um, I don't know, the biggest thing that jumps out to me is, is he doesn't care anything about, um, I guess, his fashion sense or the way he looks. <laughs> and my wife's always getting on to me about, I don't have much fashion sense. Like, I, didn't, I wouldn't know what was in style, you know, at all. And I think there's some of that in Earl, too. He just doesn't care about that stuff. You know, he just, he doesn't care about whether he shaves or how he brushes his hair or what kind of clothes he wears, how old they are, that kind of thing. And I definitely saw some of, uh, there's a character in there. In fact, it's the character that Earl comes home because of, and she, he calls her granny, but that's not his real grandmother, but she did sort of help take care of him when his father kind of booted him out of the church. Um, uh, but I, I definitely think she was sort of modeled after my two grandmothers in, uh, Georgia that, that I spent so much of my, you know, summers and time visiting. Up there in the Georgia mountains, so I definitely modeled her after after them. Um, but no, not so much. Otherwise, I've at, my, uh, at least about myself. I think I, I don't know. Somebody else, like maybe my wife, could answer that better. Yeah, I probably did some stuff. And I didn't <laughs> realize it, but I, I didn't attempt to anyway. Uh, and so, did you ever uh, 
for research purposes, do you ever go to one of these uh, services? Or, but I heard they're kind of hard. They kind of they don't like strangers. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't been to like a snake handling service. Um, but you know, like I said, I did have some real experiences with. I don't want to be too hard on on some of the churches I went to growing up, but mm-hmm. but they're definitely left an effect on me as a as an adult that that's not my thing and. Um, in fact, I can remember being just totally frightened as a child when the preacher would stand up there and stomp his foot and scream about hell and, um, you know, how that's where basically we were all going. And yeah, it was pretty scary. It left an effect uh, for sure. And that's, that's probably why it's come out in, in this book. I mean, I think it's been kind of the seeds of, of fear have been there for most of my life and, I think this might have been one way to kind of working through it was to write about this um, this character dealing with these same kind of issues being brought up in a in a way that um, he didn't really understand and didn't make a lot of sense to him, and then sort of trying to uh, rebelling against that. So you have such a busy schedule with your uh, teaching and writing. Do you start, find time to read uh, books? I do. I think you know I don't have a choice. I think once you stop reading. Um, then you're gonna, you're gonna, your writing's ultimately gonna suffer, but it's harder than it used to be. It's a lot harder, actually. And particularly when I'm really engaged in a book, like I've just been, I just, I can't do it. Um, but now that I'm, I'm finished, I've turned that one in. That was what I told my wife the other night. I'm looking forward to kind of jumping back in and, and catching up on my reading a little bit because I really do miss it, but I'm just usually so worn out and so, I don't know, stress might might be the wrong word, but sometimes it feels like that um, when I'm writing and my mind's sort of preoccupied with, with those things and I find it harder to read during that time. I, I find it more e- I find it easier to um, just go to bed instead of reading, just go ahead and sleep. Um, mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I, I do. I mean, reading is essential. I, I still try to do it and then I do it, I definitely do it when I'm not writing in the middle of a project. So. And so you said the the book you just turned in is the is the second in the Earl Marcus uh, series. Yeah, can you tell us can you tell us anything about that one? Yeah, I, I probably should have mentioned the name already, but I don't think I did. It's it's called In the Valley of the Devil. Um, so it's got a little bit of religious reference there too, um, like the Heaven's Crooked Finger. Um, but it's uh, well, it finds Earl um, about a year later. Than the, maybe not a year, maybe a few months later than the events of Heaven's Crooked Finger. And he things are relatively good for him. He is, I guess I can say this, not giving away too much, he has decided to remain in the Georgia mountains. He has a steady girlfriend uh, who he meets in the first book. And um, things are going well. And uh, then the worst thing I guess he could imagine happens I'm not going to say what that is because I don't want to give that away. You know, I don't know how much they're going to talk about it on the cover description or anything. But the worst thing he imagines, that he can imagine happens, and he is forced to see if he can do something about it. And um, I'll tell you, let's see, what else can I tell you without giving stuff away? Um, there is something that's a, that there's a legend. It, it revolves around a legend, a mountain legend, I guess you could say about a um a man named that goes by the name Old Nathaniel and he's an old civil war war legend and uh, people have apparently um sort of resurrected this legend some people have said they've seen him around and the deeper Earl tries to look into it the more sightings he finds and he finds that there may be some something kind of nefarious some a nefarious organization sort of behind the resurrection of this legend there in in the small town um, I'm doing a terrible job explaining this one, but uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. no <laughs> I just, I just tell you this: we haven't really, <laughs> we haven't written the uh, the cover copy or anything like that, or yeah. um, actually maybe they have, but I just hadn't got it all in my mind yet. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's called the Valley of the Devil, and it sort of brings him out of the mountains a little bit to a valley nearby that's actually called is known as the Devil Strip or the Valley of the Devil, and that's where there's a cornfield. Um, that's supposed to, um, where this guy, this old Nathaniel character supposedly stalks the cornfield and, and basically kills people. Um, so 
it's got a, it's got definitely got the horror element going in it too. And when that, is that going to be out the uh, next year sometime? That'll be out in July of 2018. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a good date. There we yep. go. Oh, exciting. And so, uh, are, do you have any more Earl Marcus books that you're going to be working on? Well, that's uh, there's going to there. I'm going to start the third one here really soon. Um, oh, wow. And I'm just sort of in the brainstorming um, stage of it right now. Um, so, in, in really the decompression st- stage from, from turning the other one in. So, I've just yeah, right. barely had yeah. thoughts about the next one. But uh, hopefully, something I was talking about agent, hopefully, we're going to try to maybe something by the, the new year. I'll have a direction for it and maybe even a, a chapter or two done. It's, that's my plan. All right. And do you usually, like, when you're writing, do you usually write in the same spot? Are you, like, the uh, superstitious or, or, or no, no, you get, not, get... not really. I, I like to actually <laughs> vary it up uh, yeah. because I, I get it. I don't know. It makes it feel easier sometimes when you're you're struggling with it and you just don't want to write. Sometimes it's just easier for me to go sit in a different chair. Um, I go to coffee shops a lot. Uh, the, van, the advantage of going to a coffee shop for me is um, I won't go to sleep. Sometimes if I write at home, <laughs> I'll be sleepy, and it's very easy to give into a temptation to just go take a nap. But in a coffee shop, it's harder to just put your head down and go to sleep. You kind of you just got to stick with it and write through it. And plus, there's always coffee available, so yeah, always a plus. I must yeah. say that the your, the cover for Heaven's Crooked Fingers uh, really it's really great. It's like very ominous, and I like the colors. It's a very very nice cover. <laughs> Yeah, I was super pleased with that. I think Crooked Lane did an incredible job, and I've gotten a sneak peek at the cover for the next one in the Valley of the Devil, and I, I might even like it better. So I think that's a, that's going to really please people too, and really attract people to the next book. Um, they've just got a, some, they're doing a phenomenal work over there with covers right now. Every cover I've seen for them has looked has looked great. All right, well I'm not going to take too much more of your time here. I know you're uh, you're on the road, but. Um uh, looking forward to uh, Heaven's Crooked Finger. That comes up November 7th, so by the time this podcast is out, it might be already out, but I'll have links on the website. And you have a website, too, right? HankEarly.com? That's right. Pretty easy to remember. Just HankEarly.com. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for taking time to uh, talking to us. Uh, good luck with your launch, and uh, looking forward to reading it. Well, I thank you. I appreciate you um, asking such great questions and um, setting this up. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Meet the Thriller Author. I'd like to ask you to please review and rate this uh, podcast over on iTunes. It really helps me get the word out. If you take a few seconds of your time to uh, do that, it would be much appreciated. You can also visit my website at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast for show notes on this episode, as well as information about the uh, podcast in general. And you can also sign up for my mailing list there. You'll be getting uh, special offers from our guests guests as well as information uh, behind the scenes information on the podcast and uh, please do visit my author website at alanpeterson.com i appreciate your support and so until next episode i will talk to you then